Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to this IOP lecture on physics. Today, in this afternoon, we have uh, Dr. Daniel Figueroa from the Universidad de Valencia. Um, Daniel is a, a specialist in the interplay between particle physics and cosmology. Uh, he obtained his PhD at the Institute of Theoretical Physics, uh, IFT, in Madrid. And since then, he has been a postdoctoral researcher in Helsinki, Geneva, and uh, a fellow at the CERN. Uh, now he's working at the, as a Ramon y Cajal Fellow at the Universidad de Valencia. And, um, well, he's going to speak about this afternoon about uh, whether we can, or how far back in the history of the universe we can um, take photographs or, or something similar. No? Um, so, very interesting talk. Um, uh, Daniel, thank you very much for, for coming. And um, now, well, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Okay, so as you see, the title of my talk is a question. It's can we photograph uh, the Big Bang? Uh, one second, because I see the camera covering my own screen. Okay. Uh, now, maybe a better way to rephrase this question. This is the question I want to address in this uh, seminar. Uh, let me switch off the sound here. A better way would be to rephrase this question in the following way. Can we observe uh, the so-called Big Bang? And as you notice, um, I'm using quotation marks because, of course, once we arrive to uh, an attempt to answer this question, we're going to have to define what we really mean by observing and what we really mean by Big Bang. OK, but let me begin easy. And of course, nowadays, when you uh, tell someone mm, uh, the, the term, when you mention the term the Big Bang, what comes to mind of most people, at least those who are not physicists, is this uh, funny TV show. But of course, uh, here we are going to rather take another path, and that's going to be uh, to talk about the Big Bang from the point of view of cosmology, which is the branch of science that studies the universe, and therefore terms such as the Big Bang, you know, concepts such as the Big Bang. And this gives me uh, a good opportunity now to tell you that the style of this talk, uh, or the style, I hope I understood very, very well the organizers, is going to be colloquium type. And I understand I'm addressing colleagues uh, who are not necessarily experts on these topics. And I'm also addressing students. OK, so I'm going to try to make it very, very simple. I apologize, of course, if there are experts in the audience, but my aim is to reach uh, everyone, you know, whatever your background or your speciality in physics. Uh, having said this, of course, if you have uh, more technical questions or more elaborated aspects you would like to know at the end of the talk, please let me know. OK, I'm going to start very simple. Let us define what cosmology means. Cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole. And I emphasize and I underline this aspect as a whole because it, it's a, it means that cosmology is a very ambitious science because we want to know everything, absolutely everything about the universe from all the content within, uh, say all the matter content, all the energy distribution, etc., to all the aspects of its evolution from its birth to its possible death. Okay. Now, because it is a science, okay, this is a scientific study. Uh, it means we apply a scientific method that we all know, but careful. Because cosmology is a science, but it's a biased science. It is biased in the sense that contrary to uh, many other science uh, disciplines, we cannot uh, manipulate the universe. We can only observe it. And uh, it's like that. We have to live with that. And this is probably the reason why the science, which is one of the most ancient ones, however, uh, took so long to develop. Essentially, it only became a precision science towards the end of the 20th century. Okay. Now, uh, let's uh, start again very simple. Let's continue very simple. In a first approximation, we want to describe the universe. And in a first approximation, this description should be as simple as follows. The universe is some kind of um, space containing all the matter that there is. Okay. Now, a general property of any space is its geometry. And a general property of any kind of matter, no matter the type of uh, the properties of this matter, no, no, doesn't matter actually its nature, you know, or its interactions, they all have, uh, they always have energy. So it seems like if we want to have a framework to describe the universe, 
we somehow need a framework that relates the geometry of this space with energy, with the energy of the matter content. Well, we can ask somebody uh, very clever, certainly uh, more clever than me, Albert Einstein. I think he put forward a couple of ideas that are going to be very useful for us. In particular, he made these two statements already more than a century ago. First of all, he said, listen, the presence of matter, or in particular its energy and momentum, dictates the so-called geometry of space-time. So you notice it's not only space we are talking about, it's now also space-time. Uh, I'm not going to enter into why we need such distinction. I just want to emphasize that the general statement that Einstein made is that it is the presence of matter that dictates the geometry of this space-time, okay? And at the same time, it is this geometry, this is the second point here. Uh, can the organizers uh, confirm? You see my pointer? Can you let me know? Yes, yes. we can, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay, another second point Einstein made is that it is the geometry of this very same space-time that dictates the motion of matter. Okay, and this can be uh, described very graphically with this very simple example. So here we see Earth and we see like some kind of a, a network here, which represents the uh, geometry of space-time. Uh, and uh, as you see, it has geometry because it's curved. And we see that it's Earth that is uh, causing this geometry. And then the satellite, it's actually moving, it's orbiting around Earth because it's just following the geometry of space-time created by Earth, okay? So, of course, what I'm talking about, this uh, theory that relates matter and space-time, is nothing else but the theory of general relativity that was already formulated by Einstein more than a century ago. And, uh, of course, I assume, whether you are a specialist or not on these topics, that you know that general relativity is a theory of gravity. Uh, this means that uh, general relativity substitutes the um, good old uh, idea of action at a distance of a gravitational interaction a la Newton by this other idea that there is the curvature of the space-time manifold that dictates the motion of objects. Okay? Well, uh, this uh, is a beautiful theory. Uh, I hope you, you guys have courses uh, or have taken courses of this. Uh, but I'm not going to enter much more on the technical detail of it. I just want to emphasize that this is going to be our framework to describe the universe, the theory of general relativity. Excellent. Now, if we know what is the framework for gravity that we want to use to describe the universe, now we need to describe what is the matter content in the universe. Okay. And of course, we know as physicists that uh, at the microscopic level, matter is made out of elementary particles which aggregate in atoms, then molecules, then scientists, Earth, solar systems, and that's part of the galaxy out of many suns, no? There are many stars in a galaxy. Uh, the point is from the, from the perspective of, of cosmology, uh, we don't really care about these structures because from the point of cosmology, a galaxy is nothing else but a single dot in the universe, which just contains matter. Okay, so it's like an accumulation of matter, isolated in a space, and there are many of these dots, many galaxies, okay? Uh, so now the question we wanna ask ourselves is the following. All right, if the universe, let's assume in a simplified manner, is just made of dots of matter, okay? Like balls with uh, energy, uh, which is are represented by galaxies, or maybe concentration of dark matter, of course, if you know about this. Now the question is how does the universe look like at the large scale, okay? And actually I'm showing you here a real um, photograph from the Hubble telescope, uh, which shows you a field of galaxies. And what I want uh, you is to try to address this question uh, like if we were a century ago and we didn't have all the information we really have nowadays. And if we had this picture at hand, what we could do is to trace a circle which represents a volume in the universe and what we notice is that the mean number of objects of these galaxies are the same uh, in uh, between the two circles so in reality even though statistically you may have fluctuations of how many of these galaxies you have here and there uh, on the average the total amount of uh, mass energy is the same once you take a sufficiently large volume so what this really means 
it's a, a very simple underlying uh, uh, principle of symmetry the so-called cosmological principle that states that the universe on the large scale is homogeneous and isotropic okay so as good physicists what we are going to do is we're going to solve a very complicated problem which is the evolution of the universe by uh, uh, invoking this uh, cosmological principle which is a principle of simplicity okay so first of all how good is this principle the fact that the universe is homogeneous or anisotropic well here is a simulation of the structures of in the universe in particular what you see is a net uh, or a network of filaments uh, here represented in yellow and this coloring in yellow represents the concentrations of matter which has been ag aggregated only through gravitational interaction so whatever you see any of these uh, bright uh, dots or structures in yellow what it really means is you have a lot of concentration of matter which means this is where you concentrate galaxies but if you trace uh, again some volume or some region large enough the details of this uh, network here may differ from comparing this volume on the left to the one on the right but statistically speaking they are identical so it is in this sense that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic it's really identical no matter where you are no matter at what direction you look once you uh, zoom out uh, to enough large scales Okay, and this is what a simulation uh, tells us, so that the cosmological principle is a very good principle, but uh, even though it's not part of my talk, I have some transparencies at the end, if you are curious, to show you how this compares to the actual data. And as you will see, uh, if, we, if we get the question or if we, we, we discuss about that at the end of the talk, actually it's not even possible easily by eye to distinguish the simulation from the actual observations, okay? So the cosmological principle is a very good principle uh, realized in nature. Okay, excellent. So now we know, let me um, summarize again. No, we know we have a framework, which is the framework of general relativity that relates any, uh, any energy matter content with the geometry of space-time associated to this matter, okay? And at the same time, we are invoking a principle of symmetry, the so-called cosmological principle, that tells us that the distribution of matter is homogeneous and isotropic. So, putting together these two ingredients, if you want the cosmological principle of general relativity, we do the math, okay, and this is the, the parts, of course, I'm gonna skip, and we arrive at the following conclusions, okay, according to general relativity and the cosmological principle. Uh, the geometry of the universe can only be either of three types. It can only be flat, it can only be closed, or it can only be open. And furthermore, and I think much more interestingly, the universe is a dynamical entity. There is some dynamics associated to this space and time. Okay, in particular, the universe is expanding. So, actually, these two predictions of general relativity, when put together with the cosmological principle, are the theoretical basis for the so called uh, Big Bang theory or theory of the Big Bang, which, funny enough, ironically, it's everything but a theory about the Big Bang itself, as we will see. It's a theory about the fact that the universe is expanding and has this certain geometry. Okay, so now I would like you to keep in mind from now on until I clarify this further that whenever I call, I refer to the Big Bang theory, what I really mean is these two points, that the geometry is either of these three options or uh, that we have an expanding, and that we have an expanding universe. Okay, okay. let's uh, dwell a bit more on these aspects, into these aspects. So first of all, the geometry, uh, the universe can be closed, open or flat. Now, this is very difficult to represent um, uh, three-dimensionally in your mind, but mathematically can be very easily described with the theory of manifolds, of uh, differential manifolds, and uh, it's easy to understand, however, if we do a two-dimensional analogy. So if we think of a two-dimensional space that closes on itself, this is a balloon, a sphere, okay, this is what would represent a closed universe, because if uh, some some entity, some animal would live here in the surface. If it would go all around here, it would come to the same place where it came from, okay? Or also another way to describe this geometry is that the sum of the angles in a triangle don't, don't add up to 180 degrees, but to something more. 
uh, flat and negative uh, curvature uh, surfaces or universes are infinite surface or universes where in the case of uh, flatness, uh, essentially the angles of the triangle are up to 180 degrees, whereas in the negative curvature case, they are up to less than 180 degrees. Okay? Now, if you want, again, in the turn of questions, we could elaborate more on this if somebody is interested, but this is not the main aim of my talk. I rather want to emphasize on the fact that there is a dynamical aspect associated to the universe. Okay? So, the universe has some dynamics in the sense that uh, it's expanding. What does this mean? It means the following. It means that in a given moment of its uh, evolution, say when the universe is represented here in red, it has a given size, or if you want the relative distance between galaxies is of a given length. But as the universe expands, as time goes by, the relative distance between the objects in the universe here represented by galaxies uh, also grows. So this relative distance is always growing, all right? This is the expansion of the universe. It's not the motion of the galaxies, okay? It's the fact that the space itself, where they are contained, is a stretching in time, all right? Now, if the space itself is a stretching because of the expansion of the universe, this means that now I can go forward in time, and what I find is that, presumably, there should be an initial moment in this uh, history evolution, some, somehow like an initial time where, well, we don't know what happened, but somehow this film, this movie of the universe evolving seems to have a beginning, okay? And this is what people in the popular science uh, culture uh, call or refer to as the Big Bang, okay? We will, of course, enter into the details of that, but as of now, uh, all I want you to have in mind is that due to the cosmological principle and general relativity, there is a cosmic history of the universe, okay? It's like the universe, it's like an, uh, some entity that is like alive, okay? I'm not saying it's an intelligent entity. I'm just saying that it's dynamical, it's evolving, okay? It's not a static thing. So as it evolves to, towards the future, uh, it means that the relative size uh, grows between objects and therefore, since the energy is not created, the temperature or the mean energy decreases, okay? So, generically speaking, as the universe expands, there is larger size, there is a smaller energy available. On the contrary, if you go backwards to the past of the universe, then the size, the relative distance between objects becomes smaller and hence the energy available for them becomes larger. Now, because of this, it means, uh, this implies, you know, that the matter content inside the universe has gone through a sequence of events. So nowadays we see in the universe galaxies and clusters of galaxies, but these didn't exist forever. There is a moment in the history of the universe when they were formed. There was a, there's a moment in this evolution picture where these first galaxies were created for the first time. Um, if I go backwards in time, there is even a moment where atoms were created uh, for the first time. Even farther in time, uh, nuclei in the atoms were also created in a given moment in this history of the universe, and so on so forth. I go back in time, and then we hit the so-called first second of the universe, which is where we will address the problem that gives uh, rise up the question that gives title to this talk, okay? So now let me go uh, slowly, little by little, through some of these, through the details of some of these stages, and hopefully uh, this will help you to understand better this evolution of the universe, and hence to address better the problem we want to address about its origin, the Big Bang. Okay, summary, just to, uh, to, to uh, have everybody on page. So, the universe uh, is homogeneous and isotropic, and in the moment you realize of this, general relativity implies that the geometry can only be of one type among these three, flat, closed, or open, and more importantly, that the universe is expanding, it's a dynamical entity. Now, this implies that the universe has gone through cosmic epochs. Going backwards in time, we go from galaxy formation to atom creation, to the creation of atomic nuclei, to the creation eventually of all elementary particles and mm, eventually to some initial time typically called in the literature uh, referred to as the Big Bang. Okay. okay, 
let us discuss a little bit more what is this thing of the, the what is this issue that galaxy forms at some moment well if the universe is homogeneous and isotropic let's go backwards in time in the history of the universe and let's introduce let's think of the matter in the universe let's say the matter that uh, of which galaxies are made of let's think of them as a gas of particles which only interact gravitationally okay because the universe is electrically neutral so on the larger scales only gravitational interactions matter now if i have a gas of particles more or less homogeneous and isotropic through gravitational attraction i'm going to create lamps and these lamps is are the the seeds that eventually will give rise to the galaxies and this is what you see represented in this sequence of snapshots in three dimensional in a three dimensional distribution okay now of course if uh, you are a good physicist a good student you should complain immediately because i'm telling you that we start from a homogeneous and isotropic distribution of particles and through gravitational attraction you collapse into lamps into galaxies but gravitational attraction as you know very well is isotropic okay if you remember newton's law in detail obviously tell us that gravity affects the same in every direction so what happens here in reality is that the universe at some early stage cannot be completely homogeneous and isotropic cannot be exactly homogeneous and isotropic it must have some mean number density or energy density but there's gonna be some fluctuations some deviations from this mean value and only if you assume such a thing then there will be some privilege over densities as small as they might be towards which gravity can privilege those regions in space and concentrate more and more matter as time goes by, okay? So we definitely need this uh, inhomogeneities here as an initial ingredient. And it turns out that observationally, we've discovered that the amount of this uh, inhomogeneities is of the, of the order of 10 to minus five over the mean value of the distribution, okay? And only then through gravitational attraction, then we can explain the origin of galaxies. Now, once you introduce this aspect, there is no problem to understand that if there was a bunch of matter in the form of, uh, you know, uh, atoms or, or, or even not atoms, whatever particles, you know, not joining atoms necessarily yet, well, they if they have mass, uh, uh, they will collapse gravitationally and they will form bound entities, which are these lamps, which eventually give rise to galaxies inside which eventually stars develop and then solar systems and then earth and then well as we appear in one of these planets okay so far so good i hope uh, you understand this picture is through gravitational interaction and the fact that there are tiny fluctuations in the distribution of matter that galaxies were formed at some moment okay uh, this moment it's uh, of the order of 500 million years after the mm, initial uh, uh, start of the universe okay Okay, now, as I said, there is also a moment in the evolution history of the universe where atoms were also created. Let's see if we can understand this in some detail. So let's go to the far past of the universe where in the universe there were no galaxies and there were no structures because they were only like a distribution or a sea of uh, elementary particles. There were protons, electrons, and photons. Now, a good question I think for the students would be, can you tell why they were only protons, electrons, and photons, and not any other elementary particle? Okay. Well, these particles interact electromagnetically. Okay. So let's imagine there is a bunch of them in the far past where there is available a lot of energy, and let's consider that a given electron binds together with a proton and it forms a neutral hydrogen atom. But since there are also photons, and actually there are a lot. If they have a lot of energy, what's going to happen in the moment you form a, a, an atomic structure is that one of these photons is going to come here, uh, bounce off the electron, okay, a scatter of the electron, and then the photon is going to go its way in a different direction, the electron also, and at the end of the day, what you have is a situation where you, bro you break apart this uh, atomic structure. So essentially, in the past of the universe, when there was too much energy, it was not possible to form uh, uh, atoms just because every time you would form one, there would come an electron, uh, sorry, a photon and would break it apart. But the universe is expanding, which means also it's cooling down, its temperature is going down. 
or its mean energy, you know, it's decreasing, which means that at some moment, there's not going to be enough uh, photons with sufficient energy to break apart the atoms you would form. So essentially, the situation at some moment, once we cross a certain threshold, it's going to be as follows. A photon is going to come here, it's going to scatter off the electron, but then it's going to go its way and it's not going to break apart uh, the atomic structure. So this happens when the temperature of the universe drops below a certain energy scale, which is of the order of 0 0.2 uh, electron volts. Uh, an interesting question again for students is why is it that this happens at 0 0.2 electron volts, which is like almost two orders of magnitude smaller than the binding energy of the hydrogen atom. Okay. Now, whatever the details of this, uh, this is just a statistical atomic, pure classical electromagnetism, very simple physics. What we predict is that if you start with a distribution of protons, electrons, and photons, then at some moment you are going to produce atoms because essentially the photons won't be able to um, disrupt them again. And this is very relevant, not really so much because you form atoms, well, which is very relevant because are they constitute blocks, of course, of uh, all the matter we know, but also because in the moment you form atoms, it really means on a statistical level that those photons do not see any more these atoms, which have become neutral matter now. So essentially, electromagnetic radiation is set free, and it will propagate free from then on. Okay. So essentially, associated to the formation of atoms in this uh, cosmic event uh, that I just described, there is also uh, the fact that from then on, the radiation that was available, electromagnetic radiation, is going to propagate freely, freely until we uh, have been capable of detecting it many uh, thousands of millions of years afterwards. Okay. All right. So this is the picture of the universe in its evolution, in its dynamical evolution. At some moment, atoms were formed. This is about three to four hundred thousand years after the universe somehow began. And in that moment onwards, the light is released free, travels uh, until it reaches us, and this is the origin of the famous cosmic microwave background. Okay. So, where is this light? Sorry, one second, I'm going to have a sip of water. All right, what is this light? So, how is this light arriving to us, or what is it in the universe? Well, this moment of the atom formation is also called the moment of decoupling of the electromagnetic radiation. So we refer to the moment of decoupling, the moment where this light is, is uh, travels free. And in every point of a space, uh, in that moment and onwards, the light travels isotropically to all directions, which means that there is necessarily a spherical cascade, a spherical uh, um, uh, surface around us, the observers, such that there is always from every point in this surface one line of intersection with us, such that if we wait uh, until now, until the present, then we are going to be bathed by this electromagnetic radiation coming from every direction from this two-dimensional surface. Okay? Therefore, there should be an isotropic, isotropic radiation coming from everywhere in space reaching us, okay? Not, of course, because we have any privileged location in, in our uh, particular uh, location in the galaxy or because our galaxy has any privilege. No, because the universe is isotropic and homogeneous, so any observer will always see isotropically this distribution of photons around them, okay? Now, we have detected, as uh, I am assuming, um, uh, if, if in the audience there are only physicists, I assume you've heard of this for sure. And if they are not physicists, uh, well, just to uh, you know make uh, this uh, claim, which is all the stuff already, because it was discovered already in the 60s that there is this uh, cosmic microwave background all around us. And this, once it was discovered, immediately uh, was considered uh, the definite proof of the theory of the Big Bang, okay? And uh, with this, what I want to say is that, uh, remember, recall that by Big Bang theory, what we mean is the expansion of the universe and the fact that it has a certain geometry, okay? We mean nothing else, certainly not any detail about this so-called Big Bang itself, okay? We rather mean that the universe is in evolution, expanding, 
and this was a prediction, so not a prediction, it was a prediction, it was discovered uh, a few years after it was predicted, and once it was discovered, it became a very rich uh, tool of information because essentially uh, measuring the properties of this radiation that comes from everywhere, from every direction, we can infer the state of the universe in the moment this light was emitted, okay? And now something very spectacular, which was also a prediction, okay? And it took some years to detect it. This detection only happened in the late 90s and early 2000s, but there is the prediction that the light that forms this uh, uh, seemingly isotropic uh, background of radiation cannot be exactly isotropic, precisely for the same reason that we uh, knew before that we needed some small inhomogeneity for the distribution of matter in order for galaxies to form. Since we knew there had to be, we know there had to be uh, small in, uh, fluctuations in homogeneities uh, in the distribution of matter, this also translates into the idea that there has to be a small fluctuations in this uh, field of radiation. Okay, And these small inhomogeneities are the ones that were measured in the 90s and early 2000s, and not only they had been predicted, the observations fit exactly nailed down absolutely uh, in an amazing manner what the predictions uh, were, were saying. Okay. okay, so actually it is through the study, the, through the properties of the cosmic microwave background, that for instance in the, in the late 90s, in 98, 99, we learn that actually what is the geometry of the universe. If you remember, the universe could only be open, flat, or closed, and what we learn by studying these uh, fluctuations of, uh, uh, let's say, over densities or under densities of the energy of this uh, radiation background is that the geometry of the universe is flat. And flat doesn't mean a two-dimensional flatness. It means flat in the Euclidean sense, in three-dimensional sense. So in the same sense that when we learn in the high school, there is this system of reference X, Y, and Z where we draw things, okay? It's flat in that... Uh, Cartesian, Cartesian uh, manner. Okay. okay, excellent. So going through the history of the universe, we've learned that there are galaxies and clusters that were formed at some moment. Then mm, this is made of ordinary, uh, at least the visible matter of them is made of ordinary uh, matter, uh, which is made of atoms. The atoms were also formed in a given moment, and this released the cosmic microwave background. And then I could go uh, through other stages of the evolution of the universe. For instance, if we go back to just between one second to three minutes after the so-called Big Bang or origin of the universe, we actually could uh, also uh, study what is the formation rate of the nuclei of the lightest nuclear elements. And this is part of cosmology and you do predictions and we have observed these predictions. Again, it was a prediction then observe afterwards, and it works beautifully, but I'm not going to enter any more into the details of that. If you want or you are curious, I have transparencies in my back, slide, back slides, so I'm happy to tell you more about it in a couple of slides later on if you want. Let's rather move uh, backward in time to the really, to the really, really first second of the universe. Okay? Now, here is a chart where, or a cartoon where I'm showing you the possible events during this first second, okay? Well, this line determines the difference. Anything below here is the first second of the universe. Anything above is more than one second of life. So between one second and three minutes, there is this primordial nucleosynthesis of the lightest uh, nuclear elements, as I was mentioning before, the details of which I skipped, but it's the same logic as the formation of atoms later on, okay? Now, before that, we believe there was this process uh, that we call quark confinement, which essentially tell us that the nucleons, that is the protons and neutrons, which of course, as you know, are the elementary particles that form uh, the nuclei of, uh, of uh, elements, uh, they are form of uh, quarks, and quarks were freely propagating uh, 10 to minus 4 seconds and before in the universe. But at some moment, they bind together and they form these nucleons, and this is called the so-called uh, confinement uh, or the, the quark-gluon plasma transition, which gives rise to the confinement of quarks, okay, and to, to form these binding objects. 
of of which we are formed we are made of okay so it's very very special event in the universe okay now before that we believe there is the phenomenon of uh, breaking the electroweak interactions because we believe that electromagnetism and weak interactions which are fundamental interactions were unified together during the first 10 to minus 10 seconds of the universe okay but after 10 to minus 10 seconds there is some breaking uh, of this unification and then it's like electromagnetism and weak interactions go uh, separately now before that now we enter into pure speculation but needed speculation to explain the observed universe uh, there is the uh, baryogenesis which is the annihilation of the antimatter in the universe as you know every particle in the in the universe of the standard model that we know of comes into flay into varieties uh, matter and antimatter. Antimatter is a replica, a copy of the same particle as the matter, but with the opposite quantum numbers or charge numbers. Okay. Somehow in the universe there is only matter and antimatter has disappeared. So the problem of explaining that is called the baryogenesis problem. It's a fundamental problem in theoretical cosmology and in theoretical high energy physics, and it's not been solved at all. Okay, it's an open problem. Now, if we go further in time maybe close to 10 to minus 30 seconds then there is the speculation that all the so-called quantum interactions which include electromagnetism uh, weak interactions and strong interactions maybe are a manifestation of a single interaction so there are the so-called grand unification theories that tell us that there is only a single interaction plus gravity okay and then somehow at some moment of the evolution history of the universe these interactions are split into different ones if we go further in time, there is or we speculate with the possibility of this reheating process, which is about the creation of all the elementary particles in the universe. Okay, this would be the moment where all the matter in the universe was created, and this would be uh, the stage just following the so-called period of inflation, which is a period of exponential expansion. Okay, now I know I'm going very fast through these aspects of this very first second. I'm doing this on purpose because I don't want to dwell so much in the details. Only if you want to ask me later on for questions, I'm very happy to address them in more detail. Okay. What I want to say, however, uh, is that this is the global, the current picture of the universe. And now let us address whether there is a big bang or not at all. Okay. So was there really a big bang? Okay. Well, recall, first of all, the general picture of this theoretical framework we are describing so as time goes by the universe is expanding which is represented here by the longer and longer separation of these two points now if initially i have a large density as time goes by since the universe expands the space expands then the density is going to become smaller this is the logic we've been discussing uh, the whole um, 40 minutes i've been i've been presenting this so far uh very good now the question is the following oops it's not moving transparency one second yeah uh okay okay sorry give me one second because it's not responding the computer okay i have to do it with the mouse uh okay now sorry so very good so this is the logic now the question is if i extend this logic all the all the way to the left then presumably there is this initial moment in which i would reach an infinite density okay now what is the problem with this view which is like the popular view that people have in mind when you think about the big bang and unfortunately many many people who of course have no idea what they are talking about they keep on propagating this idea okay now the problem with this view is that of course in order to arrive to this infinite density or if you want uh, to a singularity uh, we have to pass through a given density a given threshold density which is called the Planckian density this is the density corresponding to the quantum phenomena of gravity why because gravity through the Newton constant, if you translate it into energy scale, it tells us that there is such an energy scale as a privileged aspect of gravity. So when you try to go backwards 
in the evolution of the universe uh, beyond this point of Planckian density, you are describing a super Planckian universe with super Planckian densities, which means you should have a quantum gravity to describe this properly. But we do not have such a theory. Our theory of describing the universe evolving as I've been describing it before is not a quantum theory of gravity. It's not based on any uh, consistent or correct uh, principle of quantization of gravity. So essentially our theory does not apply, is not valid, okay? Therefore, the fact that there is a uh, infinite density at some initial time, it's not a prediction of any theory because we know very well, we understand very well on a theoretical basis that our theory stops being valid here. Hence, extrapolating here all the way down to an initial time makes no sense whatsoever within the theory itself, okay? It's just a naive extrapolation, but it's not a real fact because we don't know what are the details there because in order to know them, we need to have a quantum gravity theory, a consistent one, and we don't have such a thing, okay? Now, however, since we don't have that, we can still ask ourselves, okay, up to what density can I describe the universe that we are aware of? And in particular, if you want, if, if you want in a more specific uh, way to address this problem, uh, what is the maximum density we can infer from observations? And it turns out that there is such observation that tell us that there is a maximum density, okay, which is actually very large, but smaller than the Planckian density. And we know that, we know there is such a uh, maximal density, or at least it's a theoretical derivation of our observations, because we think that before uh, we reach this moment, there is the so-called stage of inflation, cosmic inflation, which is a period of accelerated expansion in the very early universe, which essentially tell us that the universe have been expanding exponentially very fast for a very, very uh, quick moment, okay? But this requires no Big Bang whatsoever, okay? This just requires that the universe inflates, which means it separates like uh, relative distances between two points in a, a 28 orders of magnitude in a fraction of a fraction of a second, okay? In a very tiny time. That's inflation. But inflation doesn't tell me nothing about any Big Bang or about any initial time of inflation, all right? That was the other theory, which does not have inflation, okay? Which, as I said, when extrapolated here to infinite energy, that's a naive thing to do because it breaks the principle underlying the theory itself, okay? Now, if we introduce inflation, we solve many problems of uh, observation in the universe, and actually there is no uh, Big Bang itself, at least in this sense of infinite uh, energy density, okay? Now, what are therefore relevant observations or questions of this first second? Well, we know already that it doesn't make sense as, as represented in many popular science books or in a, you know whatever popular science sources to think of Big Bang as something happening before inflation. Because we don't know that. It's not part of the theory of inflation at all, okay? What is perhaps uh, more mm, relevant which is a question we can really address in inflation framework, in inflationary framework, is the reheating problem of the universe, which is how all the matter in the universe were created after inflation. This maybe we could refer to it as the dynamical Big Bang. And this is a very interesting problem that can be addressed with, within our theory. And actually, you know, I did my PhD thesis precisely on this, on reheating. But this is an actual problem which can be really addressed within our framework that of course we don't have a definite answer, but it's something we can really study in detail, okay? What else can we study? Well, it's very interesting to try to address how did inflation start? What are the possible states of the universe? But this, however, nowadays has no answer, okay? Because it's very difficult to address this question because inflation typically erases the initial condition, the memory uh, from where it comes from, okay? But these are real scientific matters and questions that we address in the community and not whether there is an infinite density there or not, okay? So the current understanding is relatively simple. The universe has been expanding for 13,700 millions of years. During this time, there was the moment of formation of galaxies, stars, planets, then life. Much before there was the release of the cosmic microwave background mm, radiation, and then much before there was the period of inflation, which only lasted a very, very tiny fraction of a second. 
but created the conditions for the expansion of the universe as we know it afterwards. Now, what happens at, before inflation? Is it the beginning of the universe? Uh, before inflation, is there really a natural beginning of inflation or it lasted forever? Uh, are we coming from a bouncing universe that just was contracting and then started expanding again? We do not know. Those are matters of actual research, which uh, there are a lot of speculations, but we don't have a clear picture yet from observations, okay? But precisely, remember that the question that gave title to my seminar, it's the following. Can we take a photo of the Big Bang? Well, let me now rephrase the question. We know, we know that the Big Bang is not such a, you know, established scientific concept, but we can ask ourselves as scientists, can we take a photo, a picture of the early universe? Or more in particular, if you want, can we take a picture of inflation and the moments just afterwards? Well, first of all, of course, we need to define what we mean by photo. So it's gonna be some kind of picture, but of course, this is gonna be a picture looking into something not visible by light. And hence this, uh, this, this picture I'm putting here. But not only we need to change wavelength, more important, if we want to see something, we need to change radiation. We need not to use electromagnetic waves, okay? And rather to use gravitational radiation, gravitational waves, which as you know, they have been systematically detected from um, astrophysical systems in the last five years, okay? A question for the students, do you know why electromagnetic uh, radiation cannot be used to probe the early universe and only gravity can? Well, I'll be happy to hear your, your answer. So we, oh, let me ask, ask this as a question. Can we take then a gravitational wave picture of the early universe of inflation and just after? And the answer is, uh, as you see in a moment, very positive, why? Because if we describe the very first second of the universe divided between the stage of inflation, the stage of reheating where we create all the matter of the universe and the following stages before the nucleosynthesis, the primordial nucleosynthesis, we believe that all these phenomena actually create other phenomena such as quantum vacuum fluctuations, particle production uh, in the sense of particle physics, phase transitions, Okay, again, in the same in the in the concept of particle physics, and something very exotic called cosmic defects. Of course, these are speculations. Okay, some of them are more speculative than others. Others are more robust. But all of them, even very different phenomena, they share in common that all of them emit gravitational waves. And once gravitational waves are emitted, they travel freely from that moment onwards. And therefore, if we could detect them we could use these gravitational waves as a proof of the early universe. So these constitute so-called primordial gravitational wave backgrounds. And this is the way, or we hope it will be the way in any future, hopefully not very distant future, in which we will start probing directly the dynamical aspects of the universe in these very, very early stages. So can we take a gravitational wave picture of inflation and just afterwards? Yes, very simple answer, yes. Now, another question is, can we detect this primordial gravitational wave background, okay? In the case of inflation, we have, there's a good uh, chance or a good hope uh, that we could detect it in properties of the cosmic microwave background in the so-called polarization field of the photons, okay? And there is a plethora of experiments in this current decade which are gonna enhance sensitivity from previous experiments which are just dedicated to look for this background of gravitational waves manifested in some polarization pattern in the cosmic microwave background. In the case of phenomena after inflation, such as phase transitions or others, there is the possibility that we could detect the associated gravitational radiation with the will be first space-based detector of gravitational waves, which is called LISA. LISA has been approved by ESA and NASA, so it's an official project, it's happening, is, ha is happening and it's going to be uh, launched into, in the middle 2030s and it will be giving us data in the late 2030s, okay? So these are real, this is real science and this is the way we are going to try to eventually detect any of these primordial backgrounds and hence 
uh, have a picture of the details of the early universe. But of course, telling you this in detail would be another talk, so maybe next time. For the time being, let me thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, for this very nice presentation. And with this, I'm done. Um, uh, we do have some questions. The first of them uh, is uh, when we see the photons from the cosmic background in, say, the microwave region, and which have increased in wavelengths. Since the sorry, Bitmap, sorry, sorry. Can you repeat? Because I, I was, it was mute the sound. Sorry. Okay, so when we see the photons from the cosmic background in, say, the microwave region, and which have yeah. increased wavelength since the Big Bang, how does their associated energy change? It redshifts like any 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 radiation. Okay, so uh, if you take a given wavelength of any radiation, the wavelength grows with the so-called scale factor linearly with the scale factor, which is the function that controls the growth of the universe of the expansion of the universe so the frequencies corresponding to the gravitational waves that could be detected by the cosmic microwave background sorry these frequencies correspond to 10 to minus 17 hertz or a slightly smaller okay mm -hmm. and only only at such a small frequencies we can see the inflationary background of gravitational waves um, you were also talking about the problem with uh, infinite density. So, what does that mean for black holes? What's the density there? <laughs> the same problem, you know. Uh, the fact that in black holes we predict there is a singularity uh, inside is a prediction of that theory because you don't know how to deal with the quantum aspects of gravity. Okay. So, the quantum nature of black holes is not resolved at all. This is a fundamental problem again of theoretical physics, which could be or not related to this initial singularity of the universe. But the point is our current understanding of the universe doesn't require uh, the presence of uh, not even the speculation with that singularity. This picture is completely removed, okay? May originally, and this is well known when Stephen Hawking, you know, and other people uh, speculated uh, with this, of course, their idea came from the fact that they had understood that there was this singularity issue in the black holes. Uh, then they inverted the problem and translated it into the universe, okay? But in reality, our theories and our uh, frameworks and our observations are telling us that inf inflation is a very, very mm, good working framework, explaining everything we see, making predictions, and then there is no such a problem within the inflation uh, framework. Or at least uh, it's not natural. It could happen, but it's not a necessary prediction at all. And once again, even in those cases where you would say there is a prediction, this is just a failure of your theory because you don't know what really happens there, neither in the black hole nor in the origin of the universe, because you need a quantum theory, a consistent quantum theory of gravity, which we don't have. Okay. So, so is this is just, let me put this analogy, which I would like people to keep in their mind. This is like if you take Coulomb's law of electrosta electrostatic interaction between two charged uh, particles, and of course Coulomb's law tells you that the potential, the energy potential of these uh, charges, if you put them on top of each other, so at zero distance, it blows up, okay? So would you say that electrostatic and electromagnetism predicts uh, infinite energy? No, this is a failure of your theory. In the regime in which the charges are sufficiently close to each other, you need quantum field theory, okay, to solve this problem. So that's what we are missing here. We need the quantum aspect of gravity to tell us how does the universe really behave when we are in those regimes of high density above Planckian. But then is this required to have a valid concept of the density in the black holes, for instance? No, it, it, no, it's required to understand what is the fate of black holes and what really happens in, in the singularity, mm -hmm. which we don't know, okay? So we have a question from one of our students that I was asking, uh, with infinite density, what does that mean? No movement, no energy? Infinite density means a failure of your theory. This is the message of this talk, okay? When you do a calculation of a physical quantity and you get infinite, 
uh, you've done something wrong. So what this means, you see, the problem is people, uh, th this image of the infinite uh, density origin of the universe has propagated so deeply that then people start speculating with what does it mean. But physically, it means that your theory fails. That's what it means. And that you need to cure it. So you need some ingredient to understand how does that not happen, OK? And that's the ingredient we are missing, quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. And what would uh, a gravitational wave photograph look like? Uh, well, uh, it's uh, gravitational waves are radiation of gravitational nature. Uh, they propagate freely in a space. So once you produce them, they go through every kind of matter, like if that matter was crystal, you know, like not unimpeded at all. Okay, no, it's not a stop by nothing. This is why it was so difficult to detect gravitational waves. Uh, from the astrophysical system in first place, okay? And this is why we haven't detected these gravitational waves from the early universe yet. So how would it look? It depends on the phenomena that creates it. So, for instance, here I was talking about four types of phenomena. Depending on this phenomena, you may have one spectrum of a, or another. So, for instance, uh, from phase transitions, the spectrum is a single bump. So there is a maximum of energy of this radiation, and there is a ultraviolet tail and an infrared tail, okay? Whereas from quantum fluctuation to inflation, the spectrum is a scale invariant. It has all the amplitude at every frequency. So it really depends on the process that created this radiation in first place. And what you would see is the spectrum. It's like, it's like if you ask me, how does the how does the picture of light looks like uh, when it's not visible light? Well, what you do is you measure the spectrum distribution of energy per frequency. No, this is the same here. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we have a question: Is the universe finite? We know that the observe of observable universe is finite. Right. But how about the, the universe as a whole? Fantastic question. We don't know. We don't know because the problem is we only know what we can see in the observable universe, as, as this uh, person who has the question referred to. The observable universe is the region of space around us, which corresponds to the length that light has traveled ever since the start of the universe starting that beginning from inflation okay because we don't know what happened before okay so we cannot see nothing beyond that okay and we have we are not going to be able to see nothing beyond that now how does the universe look at the scales bigger than that we don't know what we know is up to that scale the universe has flat geometry so if i extrapolate this flat, flat geometry to every scale up to infinity flat geometry corresponds to an infinite space the universe would be infinite, but we don't know that. It could be that our observable universe is just a flat patch of a mega universe, much larger, where there is curvature and the universe close uh, around itself. This is a possibility and also a scientific possibility that people have speculated with. But we don't know the answer because it's very difficult to make predictions or much more even to make constraints from observations on this. Mm -hmm. But if the universe could be infinite, doesn't it will have an infinite energy? And then yes. coming back to the issue of having infinite energy being unphysical. And no, because one thing is to have infinite energy, another one is to have infinite energy density, okay, which is the problem. So the, if you have infinite energy density, you have infinite energy everywhere, in every point, whatever that means, okay? If you have infinite energy, your density can be finite. But you have energy which is infinite because your space is infinite. So if you sum it, it's infinite. Okay. But that's completely different from a singularity aspect of having infinite energy concentrated in a point of zero distance. Mm -hmm. um, why has the rate of, of expansion of the universe changed throughout the history of the, of the universe? Very good question, because the rate of expansion of the universe is determined by the content of matter in the universe, okay? And the content of matter of the universe is diluted 
is never created, okay? It's just diluted one way or another, depending on its nature. So for instance, if you think of the gas of particles that form galaxies, they are non-relativistic matter because they have very little uh, inertia, uh, kinetic energy compared to their mass, okay? This means that they dilute as a gas of particles. Whereas radiation, because it has no mass, no, the quanta of radiation, uh, it corresponds to relativistic species and it dilutes faster. So what happens is in the universe, there was a period in which radiation dominated, okay? And this was actually this period, just before the release of the CMB. Uh, here, the universe was dominated its energy density by radiation. But then at some moment, the radiation becomes subdominant in energy compared to the matter, the ordinary matter, non-relativistic. So matter started dominating the energy budget of the universe, and then the change of expansion of the universe adapted to the fact that its content of energy is now dominated by non-relativistic matter. And towards very recent times, then we believe there is some substance that we don't know what it is, it's called dark energy, that now is dominating the energy budget of the universe above ordinary matter. And this substance, is very similar to what created inflation here, a phase of accelerated expansion. This substance is creating now, uh, actually, acceleration of the universe. And the reason why the universe is accelerating nowadays, okay, it's because it's dominated by this dark energy fluid that we don't know what it is, but we've measured that it's there. Okay, so there is dark energy dominance, then the universe is accelerating. Before there was matter, so the universe was expanding in a given rate. Before there were the dark ages, I didn't refer to them like that, but it really, uh, well, sorry, this corresponds to matter domination yet. And then before the release of the CMB, the universe was dominated by radiation until you hit inflation, and inflation was dominated by another type of matter, which is called the inflaton. So and the expansion rate depends on the content of matter dominating the energy budget in the universe at every moment. And is there a way to know whether this expansion will at some point slow down so much that actually it will start to collapse again into probably a single point? Uh, to make, so the, the only thing we can do is since we've measured some properties of dark energy, but we don't know what it is, okay, that's the problem. So if this dark energy fluid remains always the same and never decays, so it remains as we've observed it, then the universe will expand forever and everything will go apart from each other eventually, okay? And, and all galaxies will go away from each other and the universe uh, will have a thermal death eventually, okay? Uh, because everything will cool down, you will consume all the nuclear energy in the stars and uh, there won't be way to communicate uh, between galaxies, etc. okay? But if this dark energy is something that eventually decays, okay, we don't know that. If it decays, depending on in what decays, it might be that the universe eventually will recollapse on itself. We don't know. You know, this really depends on what the hell this dark energy fluid is, which we nowadays don't know what it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I'm going to give uh, just one more minute for more questions to, to pop up, if there are any, any other. Um, so in the meantime, thank you, Daniel, for, for this very interesting talk. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to make an... Uh, oh, here we have another question. Uh, uh, what do you think of emergent gravity? Of the so-called theories of emergent gravity? Uh, it's a very interesting approach. I'm not expert on it, but I, I find it fascinating. But again, it's a theoretical speculation. It makes all the sense because, you know, one of the problems of gravity is that we know all interactions in nature, except gravity, are quantum, okay? Are very well described by quantum field theories. But gravity is source, of, the source of gravity is the energy density of these other theories. But gravity, according to general relativity, is a classical theory. So how can we have, you know, mm, you know that quantum fields source a classical theory? Well, there is this uh, perspective of emerging gravity which try to address that problem, uh, at least some of the varieties of emerging gravity. Okay, so I think it's very interesting, but I'm not expert myself on that. Mm -hmm. And why do galaxies do not expand themselves and like the space among them? Very good question and observation. Because galaxies are 
gravitationally bounded objects, okay? So if I take, let, let's make an analogy first. If I take an electron on my right hand side and a proton in my left hand side, and I just kick them and I throw them in a space, unless they come sufficiently together, okay, they will go away, okay? Now imagine a space goes uh, expanding in between them and I just throw them, uh, I throw them in a, some direction that they approach each other. But if a space uh, goes faster, the expansion, the expansion rate, that the rate at which they are approaching because of the dynamics I gave them with the kick, uh, then they are not gonna get together, okay? Because the space expansion wins. So what happens in the universe is at some moment in the evolution of the expansion of the universe, a lot of matter aggregates through the gravitational collapse. We saw this picture before, okay? And then once you have enough matter in a small region, it forms a bound state of gravitational interaction, okay? So you are typically more used maybe to uh, uh, bound states of uh, electromagnetic interaction, but gravity also forms bound states, okay? Any satellite orbiting around um, a planet or around a star, it's a bound state of gravity. So a whole galaxy is a system of many body particles, okay, which are bound together through gravity. Now, this gravitational uh, pull uh, of their own gravitational field in the galaxy overtakes that of the expansion of the universe. Hence, the expansion of the universe is not capable of pulling apart the ingredients, the elements that form the galaxy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again, Daniel, for this, uh, for this presentation. Um, before um, we leave, you go, everyone, uh, I would like to uh, make two announcements. Um, so the previous time where we had this, uh, this IOP seminar from the University of Wolverhampton, there were some issues with the, with the, um, actually with the internet connection of the speaker. We have managed to record the, the presentation. We will send it to you through well, a link to it through email. And if you are interested, you can send us back to that same email, your questions, and we will uh, well, sort out the, the answers to that. And uh, the next uh, presentation that we will have will be the 13th of January. It will be by Dr. Uh, Javier Savio, and he will be speaking about the, uh, the, how physicists can uh, go into finance world, for instance. Um, so, of course, you will be more than welcome to this uh, next presentation. And again, Daniel, thank you very much for, for your presentation, and everyone, please enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much for attending. My pleasure. Thank you very much.